The thing is that Esther's traumatic childhood would make anyone emotional. Esther's brother died at the age of eight, which made quite an impact on the little girl. Esther kept a mental picture of her brother from the moment on and longed to be like him. As she got older, her family started to become more financially stable. Though Esther's father was an alcoholic, her mother taught her to swim and encouraged her to keep fit. Esther went on to win four gold medals at the 1940 Olympics. Afterwards, she became the face of Hawaiian Tropic, appearing in TV commercials, magazine ads, and billboards. When Esther was 15, she decided that her dream was to become a dancer. She took dance classes, and when she grew up, she auditioned for the Fred Astaire dance troupe. This got her immediately signed to a contract. However, in 1935, she met Buddy McClure, who was 16 years old and already pursuing an acting career. Esther's mother, who liked McClure, invited him to live with the family. McClure soon began forcibly sleeping with Esther. The teen was terrified. She was only 17 and had never known a man this young. And what did she do? She kept this secret for two years until she finally told her mother. But Esther's mother seemed unsure about the story and never actually did anything about it. Next, Esther thought about telling her father, but he had remarried years ago and was not interested in the family. Time passed and McClure was continuing to do whatever he pleased with Esther. So, in one last attempt, she told her story to her mother and stepfather, who agreed that McClure had been taking advantage of her. Finally, in 1937, Esther left McClure, who surprisingly was already married to another woman. But what did Esther do about that? Well, one year after escaping such a traumatic environment, Esther married, and a few months after the wedding, the couple co-starred in the first film, The Hurricane. This led Esther Williams to sign with MGM. She was given a seven-year contract and $8,000 a week, which was double the Aqua Cake Girl's highest salary. MGM was paying Esther $25,000 a month, which is estimated at around $1.35 million today. Esther's contract specified that Hermes Pan choreograph her films. Pan, who had trained with Fred Astaire, was hired to make Esther's routines for her next film. One Hour With You, Hermes Pan's collaboration with Esther Williams was so successful he is frequently credited for turning Williams into a star. The choreography for One Hour With You changed Esther's career forever. Although the role gave her the highest level of fame, it came with a horrible twist, and that was getting typecast into the same role over and over again. Even today, she's better known for her movie musicals than for her classic films, and her most famous roles has little to do with swimming, which she was aiming to be remembered for from the beginning. In 1930, Williams made three movies with MGM, The Lady from Shanghai, Mary, and Seven Days in May. The Lady from Shanghai was about a modern-day Chinese woman who traveled back in time to the era when pirates ruled the ocean. Mary was the story of Mary Poppins, the nanny who magically takes care of children. And Seven Days in May was a political thriller in which the American president, played by Fred March, lies to the American people about an imminent attack on Pearl Harbor. The movie was released just two months after the Japanese invasion. Williams' most famous role, however, was not part of a movie. It was her highly provoking poses like a pinup girl in 1945. The origins of the pinup girl are in question, but it's safe to say that the term was popularized by photographer Alfred Eisenstadt's December 7, 1941 photo of a smiling, bare-chested woman in an Alabama shipyard. The photograph was taken for Life magazine, and it was the cover story. According to Eisenstadt's, Williams had volunteered to be the photo's subject, and he asked leading men of the shipyard to pose with her. Williams later appeared in the film Zigfield Follies as herself. The music thrill of a romance followed this. The film became the eighth highest grossing film of 1945. In the movie, after the hit, Esther tried a more serious role in the 1946 movie, The Hoodlum Saint. Next, she acted in Fiesta as Ricardo Montebello's twin sister, Maria, who pretended to be her bullfighting brother in hopes of luring him back home. And then, Ben Gage suddenly popped up again. Esther Williams was 15 years old when she met Ben Gage, but he suddenly entered her life again after she had just finished her first movie, Fiesta. And just in a snap of a finger, the couple was married. Ten days after Mary and Gage, she was filming The Girl from Rio. Audiences around the world loved Esther, and they were utterly going crazy for her romance with Ben Gage. However, her love life wasn't always as perfect as the movie made it look. After their wedding, 
Gage and Williams lived in Mexico, but they soon got into trouble. Gage primarily got into a fight with a hotel employee and the person called the police. The police threw Gage out of the country and put him on a one-way flight to Los Angeles. But things would get one billion times worse. While Esther was off filming her next movie, The Song of Bernadette, Ben Gage went to prison for 20 years. And with that long of a prison sentence, Esther just went on with her life, completely forgetting him along with his dramas. William's career continued for another 30 years. Despite that, The Song of Bernadette was well-received critically and became a major commercial success, becoming the 11th highest earning film of the year. Next, Esther appeared in Neptune's Daughter with Ricardo Montalban, Red Skeleton, and Betty Garrett, co-stars. In the movie, Esther sings Baby, It's Cold Outside with Ricardo. The song won the Academy Award for Best Original Song in the 22nd Academy Awards. But did you know her passion for acting almost killed her? It's entertaining to think that Esther Williams was some goddess of synchronized swimming, but in fact, the swimming in her films was all fake. Her most daring stunt, the one that almost killed her was rehearsed, but she never went underwater. Instead, she swam to a shore in a rubber suit and then climbed back to safety. During her most famous role as the lead character in Million Dollar Mermaid, her costumes injured her during filming, but she did recover quite quickly. On the other hand, her many hours submerged in a studio tank resulted in numerous ruptured eardrums. She also nearly drowned after not being able to find the trap door in the ceiling of a tank. The walls and ceilings were painted black and the trapdoor blends in. Esther was pulled out only because a member of the crew realized the door was not opening. Esther finally retired from acting in the early 1960s and turned down the role of Belle Rossum, a character with the crucial swimming scene in the Poseidon Adventure. Instead, she got more involved in the swimwear business. In April 2010, she appeared in the first Turner Classic Movies Classic Film Festival in Hollywood, California, along two-time co-star Betty Garrett. So what part of Esther Williams' life shocked you the most? Imagine you're soaring to stardom in the golden era of television. You're Jan Smithers, the beloved girl-next-door actress from WKRP in Cincinnati. You've captured the hearts of millions. Your future in Hollywood looks brighter than ever. But then, just as quickly as you rose to fame, you vanish from the spotlight. One day you're on every TV screen and magazine cover, and the next, you're a mystery, leaving fans and the media puzzled. Why would a rising star at the peak of her career choose to disappear? What does it take to walk away from Hollywood glamour, the flashing lights, the fame? And where does a beloved TV star go when they decide to step out of the limelight? Jan Smithers, the star. The story of Jan Smithers is nothing short of intriguing and fascinating, especially how she clenched fame and stardom. Smithers, one of four girls, grew up in the comfortable San Fernando Valley suburb of Woodland Hills, just north of Los Angeles, CA. Her father was an attorney. During her time studying art at Taft High School, Smithers had an accident when she swerved her automobile to avoid hitting another driver, resulting in colliding with a telephone pole and leaving a permanent scar on her chin. A few years later, Newsweek reporter David Moberg interviewed Smithers for a story about typical American teenagers in the 1960s, and she was photographed happily riding on the back of a friend's motorcycle by Julian Wasser. This carefree shot graced the cover of the March 21, 1966 issue of the magazine, opening doors for Smithers in the commercial industry as she continued her art studies at the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia. Beginning of a successful career Jan Smithers gained widespread recognition and rose to prominence with her portrayal of Bailey Quarters in the popular television sitcom WKRP in Cincinnati, which originally aired from 1978 to 1982. The series, created by Hugh Wilson, garnered a devoted fan base and remains a classic in the realm of American television. In WKRP in Cincinnati, Smithers played the character of Bailey Quarters, a smart and efficient young woman who worked as a radio station employee. The show was set in the fictional radio station, WKRP, and followed the daily lives, challenges, and comedic mishaps of its diverse staff. Bailey Quarters, portrayed by Jan Smithers, was the station's traffic manager. Her character was known for her intelligence, reliability, and endearing personality. 
Bailey's interactions with her colleagues, including radio personalities and station management, contributed to the dynamic and humor of the series. The sitcom's success can be attributed to its unique premise, witty writing, and the chemistry among the cast members. WKRP in Cincinnati tackled various issues related to the radio industry, combining workplace comedy with social commentary. The show's memorable characters, including Bailey Quarters, became iconic in television history. Throughout its run, WKRP in Cincinnati received critical acclaim and developed a loyal fan following. It addressed both the humorous and challenging aspects of working in a radio station, and its impact has endured, leading to reruns and a lasting cultural influence. Jan Smithers' portrayal of Bailey Quarters played a significant role in the show's success and remains a key part of her legacy in the entertainment industry. Personal Life Jan Smithers' personal life has been marked by a series of marriages, the first of which was with Kip Whitman. She married Whitman in 1971, but unfortunately their union was relatively short-lived, lasting only until 1972. A more significant chapter in Smithers' personal life unfolded when she entered into marriage with well-known actor James Brolin. Their union began in 1986 and lasted until 1995. During this time, Smithers assumed the role of stepmother to Brolin's two children from a previous marriage, expanding her family dynamics. The responsibilities of stepmotherhood added another layer to Smithers' life, providing her with new experiences and relationships within the context of a blended family. In 1987, Smithers and Brolin welcomed a daughter into the world, whom they named Molly Elizabeth. The addition of Molly brought joy and undoubtedly reshaped the family dynamic, creating new bonds and shared experiences for Smithers, Brolin, and their extended family. However, despite the initial promise of their marriage, Jan Smithers eventually filed for divorce from James Brolin in 1995. Divorce can be a challenging and transformative experience for individuals, especially those in the public eye. The decision to part ways marked a significant turning point in Smithers' personal life as she navigated the complexities of ending a long-term relationship. While these personal details provide a glimpse into Jan Smithers' private life, it's essential to approach such information with sensitivity, respecting the privacy of individuals and recognizing that personal circumstances can be multifaceted and nuanced. Later works in television. Following the conclusion of WKRP in Cincinnati, Jan Smithers embarked on a journey in the entertainment industry that, while less prominent compared to her iconic role as Bailey Quarters, showcased her versatility and dedication to her craft. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Smithers took on a variety of projects in both television and film. For instance, the film Hotel in 1985 was one of Smithers' notable post-WKRP television appearances in the popular drama series. She featured in a guest role, contributing her talent to an episodic storyline that was set in a location called St. Gregory Hotel. As usual, Jan gave it all he had and put out a stellar performance, showing everyone once and for all that she still had it in her. In the same year, she was about to secure another role in the series, Cover Up, but this time Smithers made a guest appearance in the action-packed series. Her role showcased her ability to navigate different genres as the show blended elements of espionage and drama. Once again, she showed her diverse and flexible she can be when it came to her acting. Then yet in that same year, The Fall Guy came along. Adding to her diverse television resume, Smithers appeared in an episode of the action-adventure series The Fall Guy as Cynthia Caldwell. This demonstrated her adaptability as an actress, as the show centered around stuntmen and their daring escapades. Again, while another film, Mr. Nice Guy in 1987 was not exactly a blockbuster, the film allowed her to explore comedic elements outside the familiar sitcom territory and in the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. In 1989, Smithers lent her voice to the animated series The Super Mario Brothers Super Show in an episode titled The Unzappables. This marked a foray into voice acting, showcasing yet another dimension of her talent. 
Despite the varied roles in television and film, it's important to note that Smithers' post-WKRP career was characterized by a measured pace, and she did not pursue roles with the same frequency as during the peak of her fame. While her screen time became less frequent, her contributions continued to reflect her commitment to the craft of acting. But in all of these, Jan soon came to a realization, a realization that would shock all her fans across Hollywood and beyond. Why Jan Smithers Disappeared Jan Smithers' last stint in the limelight was back in 87, and it wasn't for another role, but for something much more personal, the birth of her daughter, Molly. You see, Jan had this plan to take a six-month breather after Molly's arrival, just a little hiatus before jumping back into the acting game. But then Molly happened. She said, I loved my career, but when I saw Molly, I just knew, you need me. Jan spilled to Newsweek in a later 2016 interview. That's the same year they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Jan's unexpected Hollywood debut at the tender age of 16, thanks to a Newsweek cover story. Now, post-divorce from James Brolin, word on the street, or in this case, a 1999 Tampa Bay Times report, is that Jan packed her bags and set up shop in Nova Scotia. In case you're wondering why the change of scenery, well, it turns out peace and privacy were on her priority list. She recounted, I had Molly and wanted to be in the country, away from that world. I just wanted a different life. Then fast forward to when Molly hit her teenage years and Jan had an aha moment during a trip to India. The revelation? She learned to elevate her mind. According to her, I learned to meditate there and I changed a great deal. I got out of myself, Jan shared. But all these are not to say Jan wanted nothing to do with Hollywood. In 2014, there was a mini WKRP in Cincinnati reunion at the Paley Center for Media. Jan got to catch up with her old crew. She said, We all changed and it was fun to change. But here's the kicker. These reunions and interviews are a rare spectacle. Jan's not one to hog the spotlight. In fact, you won't find her on any public social media accounts. She's all about keeping things low-key and enjoying the quieter side of life. In the winter of 1973, a woman worked quietly as a cocktail waitress in a small New York City bar. Unnoticed by many, her presence was a far cry from the glamorous life she once led. This woman, known to the world as Veronica Lake, was once Hollywood's most captivating star, her signature peekaboo hairstyle a symbol of 1940s allure. Yet here she was, a forgotten icon serving drinks, her story lost in the echoes of her past glory. Veronica Lake's journey from Hollywood's golden screens to the dim corners of a bar is a tale wrapped in mystery and tragedy. It's a story that delves deep into the heart of fame's fleeting nature and the hidden struggles of those who live in its shadow. How did this screen siren, once the epitome of glamour, find herself in such a starkly different world? What series of events led to her dramatic fall from grace? And what can her story tell us about the price of fame? This is not just the story of a Hollywood starlet. It's a narrative that explores the darker side of celebrity and the often unseen battles faced by those in the limelight. The disturbing truth behind Veronica Lakey's untimely demise is a journey through the highs and lows of stardom a journey that reveals the fragile naturi of success and the human coast of living under the constant gaze of the public eye. The Enigma of Veronica Veronica Lake, born as Constance Frances Marie Ockelman, was an enigma from the very start. Her journey to stardom began in Brooklyn, New York, where she was born on November 14, 1922. The daughter of a seaman and an aspiring actress, Veronica's early life was marked by frequent moves and a growing fascination with the performing arts. This chapter delves into her formative years, exploring the roots of her enigmatic persona. From a young age, Veronica showed a natural flair for the dramatic. Her mother, who harbored her own theatrical ambitions, encouraged this passion. However, Veronica's childhood was not one of unbridled joy. The untimely death of her father in a tragic explosion on an oil ship cast a shadow over her early years. 
This loss would become one of the many hardships she faced, shaping her resilient yet complex character. Despite these early challenges, Veronica's determination to succeed in the entertainment industry never wavered. Her family's relocation to Miami, Florida became a turning point. Here, she attended Miami High School and began to seriously pursue acting. Her striking looks and natural talent quickly caught the attention of teachers and classmates alike. It was during these formative years that the foundation of her future stardom was laid. Veronica's journey to Hollywood began with a beauty pageant. After winning the title of Miss Miami, she caught the eye of a visiting talent scout. This chance encounter opened the door to a screen test with RKO Pictures, a major Hollywood studio at the time. The test was a success, and soon the young starlet found herself on the brink of a new life in the glittering world of Hollywood. Upon arriving in Hollywood, Veronica faced the daunting task of carving out a place for herself in an industry known for its competitiveness and glamour. She started with minor roles, gradually making her mark. Her unique look, characterized by her blonde hair falling seductively over one eye, became her trademark. This peekaboo hairstyle not only set her apart but also captured the imagination of the public. It was a look that would become synonymous with Veronica Lake, and one that played a significant role in her rise to fame. However, Veronica's path to stardom was not without its hurdles. The early years in Hollywood tested her resolve, with challenges ranging from typecasting to the high demands of studio life. Yet, her perseverance and undeniable talent shone through. She soon landed roles that showcased her range as an actress, moving beyond the stereotypical blonde bombshell image. Living through Hollywood illusions, the glitz and glamour of Hollywood in the 1940s was a world of stark contrasts, and Veronica Lake was at its epicenter. Her rise to fame coincided with a tumultuous era in Hollywood, marked by the glimmer of silver screens and the shadows of a world at war. This period in Veronica's life was a whirlwind of success and struggle as she navigated the complex landscape of fame. Veronica's breakthrough role came in the 1941 film I Wanted Wings. Her performance, coupled with her distinctive hairstyle, captivated audiences and critics alike. This role catapulted her to stardom, establishing her as a major box office draw. Her on-screen persona, often portraying strong, independent women, resonated with the public. Veronica became an icon of the era, her image gracing magazine covers and movie posters. However, the reality of life in Hollywood was far from the perfection portrayed on screen. Veronica's rapid ascent brought with it immense pressure. The film industry, with its demanding schedules and public scrutiny, began to take a toll on her. She was constantly under the watchful eye of the studio, which meticulously managed her image and career. This control extended to her personal life, with studio executives often dictating her choices. Despite these challenges, Veronica continued to deliver memorable performances. Her roles in films like Sullivan's Travels and The Glass Key showcased her versatility as an actress. She became known for her ability to bring depth and nuance to her characters, a talent that set her apart in an industry often criticized for its superficiality. Yet, behind the scenes, Veronica was struggling. The constant pressure to maintain her image and the relentless pace of work began to affect her health and well-being. She started to develop a reputation for being difficult on set, a label that would haunt her career. The industry's harsh spotlight amplified her personal issues, making them fodder for the gossip columns. This period of Veronica's life was a paradoxical mix of professional triumphs and personal challenges. Her experiences in Hollywood during these years were reflective of the broader realities of the film industry. It was a world where illusion and reality were often indistinguishable, and where the price of fame could be steep. As Veronica's career progressed, the cracks in the facade began to show. The strain of living up to Hollywood's expectations was becoming increasingly evident. Her story at this point is a cautionary tale of the pitfalls of fame, a reminder of the human cost behind the glittering images of the silver screen. Glamour's Dark Side 
As Veronica Lake's star continued to rise in Hollywood, the darker aspects of fame began to cast a long shadow over her life. The early 1940s saw her at the peak of her career, yet beneath the surface a storm was brewing. The pressures of stardom, combined with personal challenges, led to a tumultuous phase in Veronica's life, marked by struggles that were largely hidden from the public eye. Veronica's image as a glamorous Hollywood icon was in stark contrast to her growing personal turmoil. Her marriage to art director John S. Detley was falling apart, leading to a divorce in 1943. This personal setback was compounded by the stress of her career, the relentless pace of filming, public appearances, and the demands of being constantly in the spotlight began to take a toll on her mental and physical health. During this time, Veronica's behavior on set became increasingly erratic. Reports of lateness, unpreparedness, and conflicts with directors and co-stars started to emerge. These incidents were often downplayed by the studio's publicity machine, but they signaled deeper issues. Veronica was struggling with alcoholism, a battle that would become a defining struggle in her life. The contrast between Veronica's public persona and her private struggles was emblematic of the era's Hollywood culture. The industry often masked the personal difficulties of its stars, presenting a facade of perfection to the public. For Veronica, this meant that while her films were celebrated, her personal challenges were largely ignored or hidden, exacerbating her sense of isolation. Her roles during this period, such as in This Gun for Hire and The Blue Dahlia, continued to cement her status as a leading lady. However, the strain was evident. The glamour of her on-screen appearances belied the reality of her off-screen life, where she was grappling with a crumbling personal world and an industry that was both the source of her fame and the catalyst for her decline. An icon's decline in the midst of personal turmoil and a demanding career, Veronica Lake took on a role that diverged from her typical screen persona, contributing to the World War II effort in a unique way. The early 1940s were not only a time of personal struggle for Veronica, but also a period when the world was engulfed in war. Her involvement in the war effort marked a significant shift in her public image and brought to light a different aspect of her character, Veronica's iconic peekaboo hairstyle, while a symbol of glamour, posed an unexpected problem during the war. Women working in factories for the war effort emulated her style, which led to accidents when their hair got caught in machinery. In response, Veronica changed her hairstyle in a widely publicized event, promoting safety for women in the workforce. This act, though seemingly small, was a significant gesture that demonstrated her willingness to support the war effort and adapt her image for a greater cause. Beyond changing her hairstyle, Veronica also participated actively in war bond drives, using her star power to help raise funds for the war. She toured the United States, appearing at events and rallies, encouraging Americans to contribute to the cause. These activities showed a different side of Veronica, one that was engaged with the world beyond Hollywood and willing to use her fame for a meaningful purpose. However, the shift in her public activities did little to alleviate her personal struggles. The war years were a time of contradiction for Veronica. While she was publicly contributing to a significant global cause, privately, she continued to battle her personal demons. Her fight with alcoholism persisted, and her reputation in Hollywood began to suffer as a result of her off-screen behavior. This period in Veronica's life represents a complex interplay between her public image and private struggles. Her involvement in the war effort showcased her as more than just a film star, highlighting her awareness and responsiveness to the world around her. Yet, the contrast between her public contributions and personal challenges paints a picture of a woman caught between the demands of fame and the realities of her own life. Limelight Hidden Battles As World War II drew to a close, Veronica Lake found herself navigating an increasingly challenging landscape in Hollywood. The post-war era brought changes to the film industry and to societal attitudes, which in turn affected Veronica's career. 
Her once celebrated image began to lose its luster, and she faced a series of professional setbacks that mirrored her personal struggles. The late 1940s marked a turning point in Veronica's career. The roles that once made her a household name were becoming scarce. The changing tastes of the post-war audience, coupled with Veronica's growing reputation for being difficult to work with, led to a decline in the quality and quantity of her film roles. She was no longer the top-billed star she had been during the war years, and this shift in her professional life was a source of frustration and disappointment for her. Veronica's personal life continued to be tumultuous during this time. Her second marriage to director André de Toth was fraught with difficulties. The couple had two children together, but their relationship was marked by instability and conflict. This personal unrest further impacted Veronica's ability to maintain her career in Hollywood. The film industry itself was undergoing significant changes in the late 1940s. The end of the studio system, the rise of television, and the shifting dynamics of American society all played a role in reshaping Hollywood. For stars like Veronica, who had risen to fame under the old system, adapting to these changes was challenging. The roles she was offered were increasingly limited, and her star power was waning. During this period, Veronica made a few notable film appearances, such as in The Blue Dahlia, 1946, but these were exceptions in a career that was clearly in decline. The contrast between her earlier success and her later struggles was stark, and it reflected the broader changes happening in Hollywood and American society. This phase of Veronica's life and career highlights the transient nature of fame and the challenges faced by actors in adapting to a changing industry. Her decline in Hollywood was not just a result of her personal issues, but also a reflection of the evolving landscape of the film industry in the post-war era. Fame's Heavy Toll as the 1950s dawned, Veronica Lake's presence in Hollywood had significantly diminished. This period marked a departure from her life as a celebrated film star, leading her into a phase of relative obscurity. The shift away from the limelight was both a consequence of her dwindling career and a choice influenced by her personal circumstances. During this time, Veronica's public appearances became rare, and she took on fewer acting roles. The few roles she did accept were in smaller, less prominent productions, a far cry from the high-profile films of her heyday. This retreat from the spotlight was partly due to the limited opportunities available to her in Hollywood, but it also reflected a change in her personal priorities. Veronica's marriage to André de Toth ended in divorce in 1952, adding another layer of upheaval to her life. The end of her second marriage was a significant personal blow and contributed to her decision to step back from the Hollywood scene. She sought a quieter life, away from the scrutiny and pressures of the film industry. This period was also marked by financial difficulties for Veronica. The wealth and comfort she had enjoyed at the height of her career were no longer assured. She faced a series of financial setbacks, which further distanced her from the glamorous world she once inhabited. Despite these challenges, Veronica attempted to make a comeback in the late 1950s and early 1960s. She appeared in a few films and stage productions, but these efforts failed to reignite her career. The industry had moved on, and Veronica struggled to find a place in the new Hollywood landscape. The 1950s and early 1960s were a time of reflection and re-evaluation for Veronica. Away from the glare of Hollywood, she lived a life that was markedly different from her years as a film icon. This phase of her life was a stark contrast to the fame and adulation she had once experienced, illustrating the fleeting nature of celebrity and the challenges faced by stars in maintaining their place in the ever-changing world of entertainment. The Later Years In the later years of her life, Veronica Lake attempted a return to the public eye, seeking to recapture some of the fame she had enjoyed in her earlier years. This period was marked by a mix of nostalgia for her past glories and the harsh realities of her present circumstances. In the 1960s, Veronica made sporadic attempts to revive her acting career. 
She appeared in a few small film and television roles, but these were far from the significant parts she had once played. The industry that had once celebrated her now seemed indifferent, and her attempts at a comeback met with limited success. Despite the challenges, Veronica's return to the public eye did reignite interest in her earlier work. There was a renewed appreciation for her contributions to the film noir genre, and she gained a new audience among those who were discovering her films for the first time. This resurgence of interest provided a bittersweet reminder of her former status as a Hollywood icon. However, Veronica's personal life continued to be fraught with difficulties. She struggled with ongoing health issues, including her battle with alcoholism, which had plagued her for much of her adult life. These struggles were compounded by financial problems, as the wealth she had accumulated during her peak years had long since diminished. In 1966, Veronica published her autobiography, Veronica, the Autobiography of Veronica Lake, which offered a candid look at her life and career. The book was an attempt to tell her story in her own words, addressing both her successes and her struggles. It provided a glimpse into the life of a woman who had experienced the highs and lows of fame in a rapidly changing industry. Veronica's later years were a time of reflection and occasional resurgence in the public consciousness. While she never regained the level of fame she had enjoyed in the 1940s, her efforts to return to acting and her candid autobiography helped to cement her legacy as a significant figure in Hollywood history. Her story, with its triumphs and tribulations, remains a poignant example of the ephemeral nature of fame and the enduring impact of the golden age of Hollywood. Veronica Lake's Last Days the final chapter of Veronica Lake's life was marked by a quiet and unassuming existence, far removed from the glitz and glamour of her Hollywood heyday. Her last days were spent in relative obscurity, a stark contrast to the fame and adulation she once enjoyed. In the early 1970s, Veronica lived a modest life, having moved away from the Hollywood scene. She resided in various parts of the United States, including a period in the UK, where she sought a fresh start away from the memories and challenges of her past. Despite her efforts to reinvent herself, she continued to face personal and financial difficulties. Veronica's health, which had been compromised by years of alcohol abuse and mental health struggles, continued to decline. She was known to have had several hospitalizations during this period, and her once radiant appearance had faded, a physical manifestation of her internal battles. In 1973, Veronica made a brief return to the public eye with a role in the horror film Flesh Feast. This low-budget production was a far cry from the high-quality noir films that had made her famous. It was her last film appearance and did little to revive her career. Veronica's final years were spent away from the limelight, in a world very different from the one she had once dominated. She worked various jobs, including waitressing, a humbling turn for someone who had once been a major movie star. These jobs were a means of survival, as she had little financial support and no significant income from her acting career. Veronica Lake passed away on July 7, 1973, at the age of 50. Her death was attributed to acute hepatitis and acute kidney injury, conditions exacerbated by her long-standing alcoholism. The news of her passing was met with a mixture of sadness and nostalgia, as the public and the film industry remembered the star she once was. The story of Veronica Lake's final years is a poignant reminder of the transient nature of fame and the personal costs that often accompany a life in the spotlight. Her journey from Hollywood icon to a life of relative anonymity illustrates the unpredictable trajectory of a career in the entertainment industry and the enduring human struggles behind the facade of celebrity. In the 1950s, a young girl decided to change her name from Susan Kerr Weld to Tuesday Weld. On the surface, this seemed a normal thing to do, as many up-and-coming actresses had their names changed for various reasons. However, for this particular girl, altering her name was an attempt to come to terms with the harsh realities fate had presented to her. 
She had to turn into a different person to cope with the complexities of being a child responsible for providing for her mother and siblings at such a young age. The very struggles she endured led to her nervous breakdown and attempt to take her own life and relationships with men who could be considered father figures. The story of Tuesday Weld is unlike anything you've ever heard before, and this is how it begins. An early tragedy. For Tuesday Weld, the hopes of a normal childhood eluded her before she even began to walk properly. It all began on Friday, the 27th of August, 1943, when this cute girl was born. Bright and starry-eyed, she came into the world with joy and the innocence of a child, but it won't be long before that very innocence would be snatched away. Born Susan Kerr Weld in Manhattan, this girl's childhood was chaotic and challenging. Why? Well, let's start with the fact that her parents were not well-to-do. Not only did her parents struggle financially, her father, Lathrop, battled with several addictions that made life even more difficult for Tuesday and her siblings. But although Lathrop was struggling financially, his parents were rich, so he would often get money from them to take care of his family. Tuesday and her siblings hoped for a better life and maybe a chance to finally enjoy their childhood, but what they didn't know was that fate had other plans. Just before Tuesday turned four, tragedy struck as they experienced a loss they didn't see coming. Her father passed away, leaving them shattered and penniless. Unfortunately, her mother, Yosen Kerr, was not working at the time, so you can imagine the financial turmoil they were set to face. It was in that moment, in a pit of confusion and despair, that Tuesday's mother noticed how beautiful she was. She also saw then and there that Tuesday had the looks of a star. She then decided to start looking for modeling gigs for Tuesday so that when she got paid, the family would be about to live off her income. From that moment, a heavy responsibility rested on Tuesday's shoulders, and there was nothing she could do about it. Her father's family, who were wealthy and living in Tuxedo Park at the time, offered to take her and her siblings away, but it was on one condition, that their mother will never see them again. Although this was a chance at a better life for the children, her mother was not having it. She didn't want to be separated from her kids, so she decided to use Tuesday to execute her plan. Innocent Child Turned Breadwinner in a 1971 interview, Tuesday told Life magazine this, I became the supporter of the family, and I had to take my father's place in many, many ways. I was expected to make up for everything that had ever gone wrong in Mama's life. It's rare to hear of a five-year-old who walks around believing that they have to work hard in order to fend for their family, but this was Tuesday's reality. Her mother, Yosin, was right. She had the looks and the potential to become a successful child model, and that was exactly what happened. Yosin quickly found a way to get her daughter in modeling spaces, and before she knew it, she was posing as a child model. When Tuesday was not posing for advertisements, she was posing for mail-order catalogs, and nothing about her life resembled the life of a child between the ages of five to eight. The work she did put food on the table, so she had no choice but to keep working so that her family won't starve. The pressure was intense, but Tuesday had accepted her fate. Truth is, even grown-ups sometimes crumble under such pressure, so it was surprising that she was able to keep it together for that long. She walked around with the burdens of a 40-year-old man on her shoulders, and as expected, her little shoulders couldn't carry these burdens for long. Soon enough, she broke down and started running to unhealthy coping mechanisms for solacy. An early addiction in becoming Hollywood's golden girl. When Tuesday had a nervous breakdown at the age of nine, she didn't get any medical attention. Her mother was more concerned about her making money, so instead of taking the responsibilities off her shoulder, her mother decided to move the family to Fort Lauderdale for a fresh start but it was a little too late for Tuesday to have even a semblance of a normal childhood. She was already addicted to booze and ran to it quite often to cope with her problems. Shortly after the move, Tuesday had to move back to the Big Apple with her mother, where she would go and work some more in order to provide for her family. By this time, her life was already in shambles. She was dealing with several addictions and was allegedly involved in numerous love affairs. In the year 1956, she dipped her toes into the world of acting by appearing in the low-budget exploitation film Rock, 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 
and that was the beginning of her acting career. After a few minor TV appearances, she was noticed by Alfred Hitchcock, who decided to give her a small role in his crime drama film, The Wrong Man. Although she had a promising future in the entertainment industry, she was still struggling. Unlike modeling, where she just had to pose, acting required her to memorize lines and embody her characters perfectly, this was even more difficult. Although the roles kept coming in, Weld was suffering emotionally. She reportedly added pills to her list of coping mechanisms, hoping that she would be able to withstand the pressure, but it only kept getting worse. In 1958, she appeared in the comedy film Rally Round the Flag Boys, and in the following year, she portrayed Danny Kane in The Five Pennies. However, her role in the CBS television series The Many Lives of Dobie Gillises was said to be the role that made her a household name at the time. She became popular for her roles as a precarious sex kitten. While a lot of fans enjoyed her roles, not many of them knew that she was able to embody some of those roles because she grew up too fast. Soon enough, Tuesday became one of Hollywood's most loved teen stars, but in reality, she was suffering and smiling. Tuesday later revealed that she tried to take her own life in the early years of her acting career. When she was just 12 years old, she had enough and she just wanted to end it all. However, her attempt wasn't successful. She was quickly rushed to the hospital where she ended up in a coma. When she recovered, it was as though she decided that she was ready to focus on her career and try to love the life she had built. She later appeared in several other films like Wild in the Country and Bus Stop. She made Hollywood fall helplessly in love with her, but all that changed in the year 2001. The day she left Hollywood. This Hollywood sweetheart spent the better part of her childhood and teenage years gracing the entertainment scene, all in an effort to fulfill her mother's wishes. It was a life filled with lights, cameras, and action, as she worked hard to provide for her family. But then in 2001, something shifted. Her world changed dramatically when her mother bid farewell. It seems like her mom's passing made her question why she was still in the entertainment industry. Her mother was no longer there to force her, she was finally free. After her mom's passing, Tuesday Weld decided to hit the pause button on Hollywood. In a surprising move, she packed her bags and headed to the serene landscapes of Colorado. Seemingly in pursuit of a quieter and more tranquil existence, it was like she craved a break from the chaos, expressing a deep hunger for silence. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Despite seeking peace and quiet, rumors began to swirl. Some speculated about Weld's mental health, tossing around whispers of bipolar disorder. It added a layer of mystery to her departure from the glitzy world of Hollywood. Fast forward 17 years, and guess what? Tuesday Weld made a comeback to the very place she had bid adieu to, Hollywood. It's like she stepped back into the limelight after almost two decades of seeking solace in the mountains. The question is why the return? What changed in those years of silence and introspection? Only Tuesday can answer these questions. No one knows for a fact if she is going to return to her career one day. Imagine a world where beauty and talent are only the opening chapters of an extraordinary saga. Enter Susan George, a dazzling presence in the cinematic universe whose journey transcends the glamour of Hollywood. This isn't just the story of a starlet rising to fame. It's a gripping tale of resilience in a world where lights and cameras mask battles against towering egos and relentless challenges. With every setback, Susan's unyielding strength rewrites the script of what it means to be a true icon. From the highs of stardom to the shadows of struggle, her life is a testament to perseverance, a narrative so compelling that it blurs the line between real and reality. Who is Susan George? Susan George is a retired English actress known for her work in film and television. She was born on July 26, 1950 in Surbiton, Surrey, England. Susan George began her acting career at a young age and gained recognition for her performances in various films and television shows. In her early years, she loved acting so much that she intentionally performed poorly on her 11-plus exam during school, leading to her placement in a secondary modern school instead of a grammar school. 
This strategic choice was made to enable her to follow her childhood dream of attending drama school. Some of her notable works include appearances in The Dickie Henderson Show, 1962, as well as roles in television series like ITV Television Playhouse, Swallows and Amazons, and Weaver's Green. In the realm of cinema, she had small but significant roles in films such as The Sorcerers, 1967, and Up the Junction, 1968. Susan George's career spanned several decades, and she made a mark for herself as a talented actress. Beyond her professional life, she has been known for her holiday memories at a caravan park in Fonty Gary, South Wales, reflecting a connection to both her career and personal life. Keep in mind that information about her life and career may have evolved beyond my last knowledge update in January 2022. Early Career Susan George's early acting career was a journey marked by determination, talent, and a series of pivotal moments that propelled her into the spotlight. Her first significant break came with an appearance in The Dickie Henderson Show in 1962. While this marked her initial foray into the world of entertainment, it was just the beginning of a promising career. The turning point arrived when Susan secured her first movie role. The film that marked her debut was The Sorcerers, released in 1967. This psychological science fiction horror film directed by Michael Reeves provided Susan with a platform to showcase her acting prowess on the big screen. For a young actress in the making, this opportunity was more than just a role. It was a stepping stone into the captivating world of cinema. Following her debut, Susan George continued to carve a niche for herself in the film industry. In 1968, she took on another notable role in the film Up the Junction. This drama, directed by Peter Collinson, allowed her to explore different facets of her acting abilities. The film's narrative and Susan's performance contributed to her growing reputation as a versatile and talented actress. As her career gained momentum, Susan George continued to grace the silver screen with a string of roles that showcased her versatility. Whether it was navigating through the psychological nuances of a character or bringing emotional depth to dramatic scenes, Susan became a sought-after talent in the industry. Susan's later years in Hollywood. In the latter phase of Susan George's illustrious career, she solidified her status as a talented and enchanting actress, leaving an enduring impact on global audiences. Transitioning from the defining roles of her early years, Susan embraced diverse and challenging characters that showcased her depth and versatility. Her later career was marked by a series of remarkable performances in noteworthy films. One standout moment came with her role in Straw Dogs 1971, a psychological thriller directed by Sam Peckinpah. Susan's portrayal in the film was both riveting and emotionally charged, earning her acclaim for her nuanced performance. But also, by this time, she had started to become a household name and fame and fortune followed. Then, following the success of Straw Dogs, Susan George continued to captivate audiences in Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, 1974, a high-octane action film directed by John Ho. Her presence on screen added a layer of sophistication to the genre, demonstrating her ability to elevate diverse cinematic narratives. There was no doubt as to whether or not she was a one-hit wonder. She was perfect for whatever role she was asked to play in, and she did her job to perfection. As Susan delved into the realm of drama, her role in Mandingo 1975, directed by Richard Fleischer, showcased her versatility. The film, set against the backdrop of the antebellum South, allowed Susan to navigate complex themes with finesse, earning her recognition for the depth she brought to her character. Throughout her later career, Susan George's talent was not only acknowledged but celebrated. Critics and audiences alike praised her authenticity and emotional resonance, recognizing her as a performer who could seamlessly inhabit a wide array of roles. Simultaneously, her timeless beauty and innate charm continued to make her a joy to watch on screen. Collaborating with esteemed directors and fellow accomplished actors, Susan's filmography in the later years included 
Tomorrow Never Comes, 1978, and The House Where Evil Dwells, 1982, showcasing her enduring appeal. Beyond her acting abilities, Susan George became a cultural icon, celebrated for the indelible mark she left on the world of cinema, a legacy defined by talent, beauty, and the sheer pleasure she brought to audiences in each cinematic endeavor. Awards and Recognitions while she may not have clinched the golden statuettes of Hollywood's major awards, Susan George was well recognized regardless. One notable moment in the limelight came with the Evening Standard British Film Award in 1972. Susan George earned a nomination for Best Actress for her gripping performance in Straw Dogs. The film's controversial nature and her portrayal of Amy Sumner showcased her ability to immerse herself in challenging roles that left a lasting impression. In 1974, Susan George secured the Best Actress Award at the Brussels International Film Festival for her role in The Sorrows of Satan. This recognition underscored her international appeal and marked a triumph in the diverse landscape of her filmography. A nomination for the International Fantasy Film Award for Best Actress came Susan's way, acknowledging her contribution to the horror genre with Die Screaming Marianne in 1971. This recognition hinted at her versatility and willingness to delve into the fantastical and macabre. The British Academy of Film and Television Arts, BAFTA, acknowledged Susan George's talent with a nomination in 1972 for Straw Dogs. This nod from the prestigious British Film Awards ceremony highlighted the critical acclaim she received for her impactful performances. Across the pond, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association recognized Susan's potential, nominating her for the Golden Globe Award for Most Promising Newcomer, female in 1971 for Straw Dogs. This nomination marked her as a rising star on the international cinematic stage. Intriguing Personal Life in addition to her accomplishments in the entertainment industry, Susan shared a deep bond with animals, particularly championing animal welfare causes. Her commitment went beyond advocacy, extending to her active involvement in initiatives aimed at improving the lives of animals, reflecting a woman with a compassionate heart dedicated to making a positive impact. Not only a talented actress and philanthropist, Susan George is also an avid equestrian. Her passion for horses transcended mere appreciation. She actively breeds Arabian horses with a stud farm named Georgian Arabians. This facet of her life showcases a unique connection with nature and animals, demonstrating her commitment to nurturing and preserving the beauty of these majestic creatures. Susan's personal interests extended into the world of entrepreneurship. Her ventures in the fashion industry highlighted a creative side that complemented her artistic pursuits, showcasing a woman of versatility and entrepreneurial spirit. In her personal life, Susan George's relationships were integral to her journey. She shared a profound connection with British actor Simon McCorkendale, whom she married on October 5, 1984, their union, lasting until his passing on October 14, 2010, marked a significant chapter in her life. Despite not having children, their partnership was a testament to enduring love and mutual support. Before her marriage to Simon, Susan's personal life included a four-year relationship with American singer Jack Jones. Around 1980, she spent another four years as the partner of casino manager Derek Webster. These relationships, while not without their complexities, added layers to Susan's personal narrative, shaping the woman behind the actress. As Susan George navigated the complexities of both her personal and professional worlds, her life became a mosaic of experiences, from the warmth of family bonds to the excitement of romantic entanglements, from the quiet joys of horse breeding to the entrepreneurial spirit that fueled her creative pursuits. Her journey humanizes her beyond the cinematic spotlight. Susan George was a woman of substance, passion, and purpose.